This video made possible by Killer Visual Strategies. Let us tell your story. Visit KillerVisualStrategies.com to learn more. Well, this is going to be fun. Now, <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I was joking that you know, it, interviewing you is uh, oh, with, that's with a horrible the, picture. Okay, the, the experience that not not your favorite picture. Is that what you said? No, that was my official thing. Yeah, but it's okay. All right. Well, you know, it's I've a few. Some... It's a few glasses ago. But, it's a few. Yeah. <laughs> well, so do you agree with that assertion that I made uh, in the intro there that you've effectively moved from from one world power to another? I I get the comment, and there's no question that uh, uh, Amazon is uh, a large. Uh, company with with influence, uh, but uh, it is not, and no company is nearly as uh, important, relevant, or powerful as the United States government um, or the U.S. president. So, uh, within within the the private sector, sure. But it's it's. I think one thing perhaps that I bring to this job, and and people like me who've done that kind of work, is a little bit of um, perspective on. What a crisis really is, and, and uh, you know, back when I was in the White House, crises involved uh, life and death decisions, sent deploying troops, uh, whether or not we'd have health care for millions of people who didn't have it, uh, and 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 issues of that magnitude, and and we deal with issues at Amazon that are incredibly relevant and important, uh, but. Uh, I think I can I can help at bring a little perspective on on their significance when I'm when I'm talking to my my colleagues at Amazon. Here's maybe a better picture. Just... Yeah, those were great days. Tell me about this. Look, I it all happened serendipitously. I was you mentioned I was a reporter. That was my life. 21 years, 20 years at Time Magazine, and I wasn't I had, didn't have plans to make a change. But as uh, serendipity would have it, I'm in a really crappy garage band with a guy named Tony Blinken, who uh, is a foreign policy person in DC I've known forever. He's a very close friend. And he had been working for Joe Biden uh, in the Senate, uh, his staff director on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And, you know, Biden got picked, Obama Biden won. I'm talking to Tony the day after the election. And uh, I was, as a reporter, not an advocate at all. Uh, but Tony knew that I was very supportive, even though I had been close to McCain, that I was uh, strongly supportive of, of, of the Obama candidacy and excited about his win. And he began talking to me about, hey, you should come in. And I was thinking, well, I speak Russian. Maybe I could do something like buried in the State Department. And uh, he's like, well, maybe, but how about talking to the team about becoming communications director? And, you know, these things are it's weird how it happens. I had, I had met Obama a number of times. My editors, I was bureau chief for time, wanted to, like everybody wanted to meet him back in those days after he won in 04. Uh, but I had not written about him uh, because I oversaw our political coverage. And, you know, the back in the 08 race, everybody wanted to cover the Ds that year. And, and I was a benevolent boss. And so I backstopped on McCain. And of course, if I had written about President Obama, you know, who knows, maybe I would have written something that uh, prevented me from ever joining the administration. I did cover, I wrote one story about his race speech. Remember his famous race speech? I gave it good marks, so that was good. But, um, and I had never, I had known Biden a little bit, but not well, and never written about him. So uh, we hit it off, and suddenly, right in December of 08, I was leaving journalism and, and entering this new world. And I thought it would be a couple of years, but then the president asked me to be press secretary, and it was just a phenomenal experience. And I would have stayed to the end, um, but uh, my wife reminded me that I had said two years, and it was five and a half, and it was time to, time to you know, take on a like, really relaxing job like this. <laughs> Speaking of, yes, so and I want to circle back before we end to the current political environment and the environment in the room where you once held court. But I, I do want to ask, who is the tougher person to work for, President Obama or Jeff Bezos? In terms so there, look, I've been very lucky in my bosses throughout my life. I think if you've had that in a career, uh, you know, I've, I've really never had a bad boss uh, in journalism or politics or now in, in uh, the private sector. But, you know, they're, they're obviously different in so many ways, but um, they're very similar in one particular way, which is they uh, are both very long view focused. 
They're both, uh, and Jeff has historically been uh, willing to not do the things that typical companies or CEOs do when it comes to like, you know, managing by quarter and maximizing share, all that stuff that he was criticized for in the early days. Uh, it, you know, investing to scale and, and, and uh, staying frugal to reward customers, all these things. And, and he was willing to take some heat for it. And, and uh, President Obama was the same way, partly because he was so, he, he was, you know, a phenom who had risen from nowhere to become a candidate for president, really. And uh, so he, he wasn't part of the Washington game. He hadn't been running for president for most of his life and, or most of his adult life, and he hadn't been on the national stage. And it just meant that he didn't see things the way others did. And he wouldn't do things that we would, I and some of his other advisors would tell him that he absolutely had to do because this is what one does to win the day or win the week in the media cycle. And he'd be, he'd listen, always listen, sometimes agree, but often just say, no, I'm not doing that. And we might pay a price in the near term politically, but it was very consistent with the way he saw things. Yeah. So as you're talking with Jeff Bezos in particular, what types of advice does he seek? What types of lessons does he seek to learn from you about what happens in Washington, D.C.? And what have you been able to share? Huh. Well, I guess, you know, Jeff is not, uh, you know, somebody who's very political, and he's uh, not spent much time focused on that world, uh, either at the political or policy level. So, you know, before me, and certainly, can, you know, as I've been there with the excellent team we have in place, you know, he gets a lot of, I think, useful insight and information about how, how policy making happens and or how it doesn't happen uh, in the case of Washington, how, uh, you know, what, what different uh, influential leaders might be thinking what 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 interests them the most and one of the things we've tried to do in in Washington in in growing there it was an incredibly lean presence uh, when I started was to you know we have some subject matter experts now we have we've become a resource uh, not just a, a you know not just a team that reacts to things but you know we can provide information and perspective to policymakers and and, and help inform them about our business model and what we do, um, as well as you know, sort of give them general information about how the markets work and, and how, uh, how the kind of technology we use uh, works and affects customers. Yeah. Well, obviously, one of the key issues this year is questions about uh, antitrust scrutiny. What is your response to lawmakers, other retailers, competitors, including some of those who use your platform, who say, Amazon is too powerful, needs to be regulated more strictly, or even broken up? Well, we'll say, I say, we say a, a couple of things. One is uh, consistent with what Jeff has said publicly, which is, uh, of course, we'll be scrutinized. We're a big institution. All big institutions in this country uh, merit scrutiny, whether they're nonprofits or government agencies or uh, large companies. Uh, we think, and our aim is to that will come through that scrutiny well because we have a really good story to tell. And uh, what, what I found in Washington, and not just in Washington, but around the country and sometimes around the world, is that the perception of Amazon is a little different from the reality. Uh, we, because of our business model and the fields that we enter, like our core business in retail, I mean, this is, this is maybe the most competitive space in the world uh, of, uh, uh, of the economy. And, Notwithstanding our size, we're less than 4% of retail in the United States and less than 1% globally. And you'd be, I am surprised, and you'd be surprised by the number of members of Congress who don't know that. I, I got into a, a spirited conversation with a member of Congress not that long ago, somebody who'd been in office for a while, and, and she just wouldn't believe me that Walmart was two and a half times our size. So I had to like get out my phone and show her the Google search and, and it's, they are, you know, it's, which is not, to, we're not even the biggest retailer in any market where we have a, a, a business, which is not to say we're not big. Um, another thing that's a misconception is that we're, we're monolithic. And as you know, because you know the business, uh, you know, the fastest growing part of our retail operation is third party sellers. It's growing twice as fast as our uh, owned inventory retail. And that's empowering millions of small and medium sized businesses around the world. Uh, you know, and uh, I think we have 200,000 of them who've, uh, you know, with revenue of over a million dollars. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's a great fact to point to when 
there are conversations about what the impact of a, 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 of a business like Amazon is on small businesses. You are a single digit percentage of retail sales writ large, but if you look at total US e-commerce sales, mm -hmm. you're right around 40%. And the next biggest competitor is eBay at, at 6%. So as you know, like a lot of these antitrust discussions come down to defining the relevant market. And so it sounds like your argument would be that retail writ large should be the market, whereas others might argue that e-commerce in particular well, should and be. I, uh, you're right, and I think, I, I think the most recent survey said 37%, just to, yeah. but, and that's outside, that's not us. But, the, but, but you're right that that is our argument, and I, it's also logic, because there's not a retailer in, an, in the country and, and soon in the world that, uh, that hopes to have success that isn't hybrid, that isn't, it may be a physical store uh, principally, but it's also online. It may be, uh, you know, like oper you know, some businesses that have started online and now uh, uh, established uh, physical stores. You, know, you see Amazon getting into the physical retail business. And, and that's, you know, so obviously we don't think e-commerce is going to eliminate physical retail because we're investing heavily in physical retail. Look, I mean, going back to Walmart, you know, obviously long uh, standing and, and uh, very large and successful retailer, their recent success has been driven largely by their uh, success in online. So how do you, re how do you, how do you say we're just going to regulate e-commerce and who do you leave out then? How, you know, what, at what, uh, you know, do you set thresholds? I just, we, you know, we think, here's, here's the test for me of a market, right? You want a lawnmower. If, you, if we controlled e-commerce, right, or if any, if any company controlled e-commerce or had like a dominant position, we could raise prices for lawnmowers and, and uh, you'd be stuck, right? But you'll just go down the street and get a lawnmower, right? You'll go to the, to the local physical store or another e-commerce uh, e site and, and, and get that product. And, and we compete all the time, uh, every day, every minute with uh, retailers that are offline and online for customers. And if we don't offer that value proposition and the convenience uh, and a low price, then of course they're going to go somewhere else. You, though, have this huge built-in advantage with Amazon Web Services providing uh, revenue and ultimately profits into the company. And, and it's, it's, there's sort of these gray areas where Amazon's power can be perceived from the outside to be unfair. And I, I happen to be wearing the, the new Amazon 206 collectives that the Allbirds has spoken out about and uh, that are uh, very similar to their shoes. Uh, I, uh, we talk with retailers who feel like they are effectively competing against a company that can lower prices because they have this advantage in Amazon Web Services. I realize these things aren't necessarily illegal or unethical, but they can be seen as unfair. You, well, let's, let's, let's tease that apart. A AWS, Amazon Web Services, is obviously a, a very successful uh, part of our business, and its margins are, are a, a little wider than uh, the thin margins of retail. But it is a simple fact that is established by our filings that our consumer business is profitable. We do not, the, the, our other businesses do not fund the retail business. And, uh, you know, the margins are smaller. We've been making that point for a long time. Uh, you know, we're in, it gets highly competitive uh, and uh, retail is always uh, a matter of uh, very slim margins. But, uh, but Amazon is successful on its own as a, as a retailer and, and competes it, uh, accordingly. On the issue of, of private label products, you know, of the big companies, retailers that you know in this country and around the world, we're the worst at it. We have the smallest percentage of our revenue that comes from private label, 1% of our revenue. There are, there are competitors out there, you go to their stores or online, and it's 20, 50, 25, 38%, 80% of uh, what they sell is private label. So, you know, the fact that we have, you know, we've made some investments and tried to get some traction in private label is only because we're trying to, we're listening to customers and hearing their feedback and trying to provide them products that they want. But, uh, I don't want to knock the team that works on that, but if we're at 1%, we're, we're not exactly, uh, you know, killing it in that area. But do you consider third-party retailers customers? Yes. So what do you say then when those customers are complaining that they feel like uh, you need to That be we work our butts off every day uh, for them to make sure that they succeed as much as possible on Amazon, and the proof is in the numbers. They're growing twice as fast as our inventory. So. Uh, the whole, long before my time at Amazon, maybe before you were paying attention, but when, when the company 
introduced this marketplace idea so that it could you know, vastly expand selection for customers because that's what they wanted. And they invited other sellers into what had been a wholly owned uh, store with only Amazon products. People thought, I mean, the market thought Jeff was crazy. It was like, why would you let on a completely equal footing somebody else come into your store and compete with your products? And the answer was because ultimately it will pay off down the road because that's what the customer wants. The customer wants the breadth of selection. The customer wants the customer reviews that then help him or her make a decision about what, uh, what product is best and, and most reliable and has the best price. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a completely... Uh, in our DNA, but also in our interest to ensure that our small and medium-sized sellers succeed. And we work every day to, to help them succeed. So it's great to be able to talk to you because there's so many nuanced and interesting issues. And obviously the, the area of competition is mm -hmm. one. Um, another is the just issue of privacy, free speech, and uh, Brad Smith on stage here yesterday credited Amazon for signing on to the Christchurch call mm -hmm. after the tragedy there. Uh, to try and block uh, streaming of live incidents such as that. And, and unfortunately, there was another today in Eastern Germany, um, and it was live streamed on Twitch. Uh, where is this headed? Can technology be created such that we can preserve free speech yet also prevent these kinds of inc incidents from being broadcast live to the world? So, I mean, to back up, just uh, you know, Brad deserves a lot of credit for, for the uh, leading role he played in, 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 uh, in arranging that, and we were delighted to participate. The Prime Minister of New Zealand is an incredibly compelling world leader on this issue, and, and I think uh, when you talk to her, you can't say no, and, uh, and I admire her greatly for the, for the lead she's taken on this. And, you know, I think Brad was noting that, you know, we don't have as, we don't, you know, we're not a social media, we don't, you know, but Twitch is an area. And, and, and what happened today is uh, uh, horrendous. And, and I know that Twitch is, uh, has either taken it all down uh, or is actively uh, uh, working on that now. And that any, any customer that has posted or reposted any of that stuff is off for good. And we'll work with authorities to make sure that, um, that we're doing the right thing in this regard. And to answer your bigger question, look, I think the only answer is uh, effective cooperation between uh, private sector technology companies and governments. Because, uh, you know, we have the, 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 the deep view into how the technology works. We have the expertise to, to, to help uh, governments uh, and policymakers around the world make balanced decisions about, about how to, how to uh, regulate in this space so that we don't, uh, that we can, you know, that we can as much as possible prevent that kind of use of the services without stifling innovation or, you know, overly limiting free speech. And these are the, these are the unbelievably compelling and complicated issues. It's the fact that we're even a small part of this conversation uh, and we're a bigger part of other incredibly compelling conversations is why I love working at Amazon. I mean, it's, I tell my teams all the time, I, you know, when they, they feel like we're, you know, we get a lot of incoming and, and yeah, you know, it's like, isn't it great? Because we get to, we get to be part of these really, really vital world changing discussions. Another of those world changing discussions is happening right now in terms of artificial intelligence and facial recognition. And Jeff Bezos told reporters a couple of weeks ago that Amazon is working on facial recognition uh, regulations that it would propose mm -hmm. to Congress? Yeah, we would, we, I mean, our plan is, uh, uh, Jeff was right, of course, uh, but um, and we had said earlier, we posted uh, on our blog site, my colleague, um, Michael Punk, uh, former ambassador of the World Trade Organization who now works in our policy shop, he, he wrote a blog post that laid out sort of the the guidelines that we are working under, sort of the general principles, and now we're going deeper into uh, uh, suggestions about how this technology should be properly regulate, regulated, because we believe uh, two things. One is that like any new technology, uh, it, it, can be a, uh, it can be used powerfully for good and potentially for ill, and you wanna make sure that you maximize the former and minimize the latter. Uh, and we were eager to work with lawmakers and regulators uh, to, to find that balance. 
you know, I would note that with our service, uh, you know, where the discussion is often around uh, law enforcement use of it, uh, we have yet to have a report of abuse by a law enforcement agency. If and when that happens, that, that customer will be cut off from our service. What, wherever we are in the process of regulations and legislation, I mean, ultimately, the use by law enforcement agencies of technology like, uh, like this, just as was the case with DNA, needs to have some guardrails around it. And those guardrails have to come ultimately from policymakers uh, with the input of, of businesses, I think. So, so your specific input to them, will it deal at all with the issues or the questions of whether or not facial recognition accurately identifies women and people of color? Or? Well, so we already, we, we uh, when we sell to law enforcement agencies, we, you know, our instruction to them is this technology should only be used in this use case with, uh, at the 99% certainty level. And there have been, taste, I think, somewhat disingenuous tests of the, of the technology that have set the uh, reliability level or the confidence level much lower, but that's not how it's supposed to be used, and that's not how law enforcement customers are meant to use it. But these are the, neutral researchers from MIT. Well, not all of them have been neutral, but, the, but again, if they set it at 80%, you're gonna get 80% results, but law enforcement agencies are very clearly uh, told that the proper usage of this should be at the 99% confidence level and should always have human review. And again, we still have not, we've yet to have a, uh, have a documented case of abuse. I'm not saying that won't happen, because it obviously could. But ultimately, to control how law enforcement agencies use technology, uh, you know, companies can't do that in the end, because these are government agencies. Governments have to, and, and policymakers and legislators have, legislators have to. It's, it's important that, I, I think DNA is instructive. When DNA was first introduced into our judicial system as a tool, evidentiary tool, the ACLU and others were extremely concerned. Uh, there was a lot of talk about how this would lead to big brother government um, uh, uh, you know, over intrusion into our privacy. I think it's fair to say that civil libertarians feel um, elated by how DNA has been used in the judicial system. There are so many people who have been found innocent on death row because of its use, and, uh, and that's an example of technology that, that has the potential for both good and ill. Uh, being properly used and regulated for good. And, and I think you don't want to have, you don't want to prevent the upside potential because in our case, just with our service, there have been hundreds, and, if not thousands, of cases of missing children found, of victims of human trafficking saved because of the law enforcement use of this technology. We want that. Uh, we just are extremely aware of and understanding of the fact that there are there are concerns about how this could be abused. So that's where we need to get regulation and law. Yeah. Well, in the time we have remaining here, I, it would be remiss if I didn't get your big picture thoughts on what's happening in Washington, D.C. these days. It's pretty quiet. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever wish you were back there behind that podium? Only uh, in that I wish my old boss was back there behind <laughs> okay. that podium. I mean, in that. Uh, <laughs> It's not a place I recognize or a job that I recognize, not that they really even have that job anymore, but... Um, What's different? <laughs> look, I, I covered two White Houses before I went to work for one, the Clinton White House and the, and the uh, George W. Bush White House, and, and virtually with no exception, everyone I dealt with in those administrations, whether I personally agreed or disagreed with what they thought were the right policy decisions or the right way to approach things. Uh, I, I never doubted that they were patriots. I never doubted that they believed they were doing things that were in the best interest of the country. Um, I, I don't feel that way now. And I, uh, I worry great, I mean, there were things that we thought were, uh, could never change in our country that we realize aren't governed by laws, aren't controlled by laws, they're controlled by norms that have been built up, like the, the, the way we behave in our, uh, in our governmental institutions and you know, have, are governed largely by precedent. A good example of this is I, was, I had it drummed into my head by everybody on our economic team that I would never, ever, ever talk about the Fed hmm. or Interest rates. We don't do that from the White House. That would be, un, you know, that would, critics would pounce on you for trying to tamper with the Fed. I guess they didn't get that memo in the current White House. And I also, look, I mean, 
critics of President Obama and of me might uh, laugh at this, but I never lied. I sometimes said things that turned out to be wrong and we would correct them, but not knowingly did I say that. And uh, I, not just because, I, not, be, not at all because I'm, a, we were morally superior, because we thought that was, would be terrible for the president, for the White House, for the administration, for the country. Like for the credit, I mean, it is, you know, it is any, any, any presidency, uh, you know, is, is always in a struggle to retain influence and, and credibility. And if you, why would you inflict that on yourself? And, you know, so when you can't answer something or you don't have a good answer to give, you say, I'll take that question or I don't have an answer for you. You don't lie. And uh, there, there doesn't seem to be that standard today. Well, what about the state of the media as it relates to politics? Obviously, you're comfortable and, and uh, you <laughs> know how to sort of joust back and forth. You have to from behind that mm -hmm. lectern. Um, but it feels like it's something different today. What, what are your observations about the state of media look, and its relationship with policy and politics? So I, look, we, we got into it. I got into it. We would get frustrated. There were stories we hated. I would yell at reporters. I may have yelled at some in here this room today. But, the, the, but fundamentally, I believed, given where I came from, and I know that my colleagues believed, and I know President Obama believed, that, that the, the, the service and the val provided by and the value uh, that comes from a, a, an independent media is elemental to our democracy. Of course they're not always going to get it right, and they're not always going to tell it the way we want it to be told uh, as subjects of it. And that's true now, obviously, at Amazon. But, the role is so vital. And in some ways today, you know, one of the things that was frustrating when I was there and we would frustrate is that uh, there was this urge by reporters to like cover the next big gate, right? So what turned out to be minor things were always like, remember how, I, I can't tell you how many times in the five and a half years I was there that reporters had declared that this is going to be what dooms the Obama presidency, whether it was the Deepwater Horizon spill or the IRS the issue, you know, whatever it was, and it was, and, and, or healthcare, the, the screw up with launching healthcare. And then when things worked out and didn't turn out to be that serious, it'd be like crickets. Nobody would ask about those issues anymore and we'd move on. That was frustrating because it felt like, uh, you know, they were sensationalizing stories and making, making crises out of things that weren't. That's not happening today. These are crises for real. And I think, uh, more than ever we've seen from the independent media, you know, why they're important. Uh, and, and I think that while I know they're exhausted, my former colleagues on that beat and, and in Washington are uh, working hard on really noble cause, you know, and not always getting it right and, you know, often falling prey to the, to the, the way that political reporters tend to cover things as a, uh, uh, as a competition and a, and, a, and a race instead of a, you know, instead of at a higher level, but mostly there's been great work and, and we are lucky to have them. You talked earlier about sort of the excitement, the, the, how interesting your job is. What would be your final message here to the, the crowd of uh, tech leaders, business leaders, scientific leaders about your role at Amazon, where you see the, the future of tech going? What, what would you want to leave this audience with? Uh, if you're not a Prime member, I highly recommend it. Um, it is Prime Day at GeekWire with yeah, uh, you and Dave here exactly. on stage. No, look, I think, I think we're all, Amazon's just one of many companies that are, are uh, small and large that are, that are part of these important conversations. And like, these, are, these are healthy debates. We have a very strong perspective on the competition issue that I think that has been mischaracterized, but on other issues around privacy and facial recognition and, and, uh, and the like, there are, there are valid views and we will, there will be debates and there will be, uh, there, you know, some kind of compromise result will take place and, you know, we'll, we won't love all of it, other tech companies won't love, you know, it, it, but that's how the process should work. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, what I hope for from the political process in this is, is that open-mindedness, one of the things I find frustrating, and I'm going to do my thing here, is, you know, I, I never, I don't ask uh, anybody, uh, especially in, in uh, the Democratic Party right now, to, you know, run around campaigning on the fact that Amazon is good for the country, but, because I know that's not politically palatable, but the, the fact is we are, and I do, I mean, my view is if you're a Democrat or you're a progressive 
who still believes that capitalism is effectively regulated, is the best engine for economic growth and therefore poverty alleviation and job creation, uh, then what do you want large companies, large employers to do? You want them to raise wages. As you know, last year we raised our minimum wage to $15 an hour. We've been actively lobbying in Congress for the federal minimum wage to be raised to $15 an hour. And if that were to happen, no, no doubt our wage rates would, would, like everybody's, would go up from 15. Uh, what else do you want major companies to do? You want them to provi provide their employees with full, comprehensive, high quality benefits. Everybody at Amazon has always gotten the same health care benefits if you're a starting fulfillment center worker uh, as I get, right? And then as senior executives get. And then you, you, because of the, the changing economy, you want companies to invest, companies with the capacity to invest in this, to invest in upskilling, to, to create opportunities for their employees to learn new skills so that they can find jobs that are higher paying. We have been doing this for a long time with our career choice program. We just announced this uh, $700 million investment to upskill 100,000 Amazonians over the next several years. Uh, that's, that will be, up, you know, and across, it's not just fulfillment center workers, that's, that's software developers who want to learn new skills. And, you know, some of the skills they learn will uh, mean that they'll stay at Amazon. Sometimes they'll learn skills that take them elsewhere, and, and that's okay too. But, but that's what you want companies to do. And companies of scale, like Amazon, can do something like that and have a, a broader impact, right? By setting a $15 minimum wage, we put pressure on other companies to do the same. And uh, we've actively called on other companies to do the same. And, and you know, I think that's, that's, there are 40 million Americans working today who get paid less than the lowest paid person at Amazon. 40 million. And to hear some politicians talk, you'd think that, you know, that wasn't the case at all. And I'm, I'm really worried about those 40 million. Uh, as I am also, you know, focused at, uh, on, on Amazon workers and making sure that we provide them the best experience possible. Jay Carney, thank you very thank much you. for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.